This episode and all episodes of LedgerCast are brought to you by Brave New Coin. Go to ledgerstatus.com slash BNC. Check out BNC Pro. You can join the waitlist today for this, but it's a great new way, uh, really comprehensive application for managing all of your cryptocurrency activities. It's a secure and unified suite of applications and tools that allow you to research, chart, screen, analyze, uh, see reports, and optimize your cryptocurrency holdings. Uh, there is so much going on inside of BNC Pro. I got the chance to log into it, check it out, and, and see what it's all about. And it is super awesome. You're going to really like it. Go to uh, ledgerstatus.com slash BNC to check it out. And thank you to Brave New Coin for being a LedgerCast partner. Hello and welcome to LedgerCast. My name is Brian Krogsgaard. Today we have a special guest. It's Wes Pryor from Liquid Malta. Uh, his firm is a market-making firm. He's got a lot of experience in crypto. I've uh, chatted with him on and off throughout most of 2019, so I'm happy to have him on the show. Hey, Wes, how are you? Hey, Brian. I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Yeah, I'm pleased to have you. Uh, it took me a while to figure out what you and your firm do. Uh, I'm sure I still have plenty of gaps to fill, but at a baseline, if you give the you know one or two sentence summary, uh, what does Liquid Malta do? Uh, we are an algorithmic market maker bringing new digital assets to the world. Okay, so new digital of... assets to the world. So yeah, that's great. You're you're primarily onboarding tokens. So someone has some kind of utility token or something that's going to be tradable on some exchange and you're helping them get initial liquidity? That's right. So typically, uh, we're, I, I'd say we're bringing them to the world because typically um, for most clients, we're the first bid and ask in the market ever on any exchange for that particular asset, uh, which is okay. quite exciting. Yeah. So I'm curious about how some of that works uh, because you have to have both tokens and whatever the, the pair is. So if it's versus, you know, Tether or Ethereum or, or Bitcoin, like you totally. have to have those the base pair and you have to have the token itself available to you so that you can make both sides of that market, right? That's absolutely correct. So how do you decide? Um, let's say, you know, let's say we've got the ledger status token going live. How do you decide, <laughs> Hey, this is where we're going to start this book and, uh, and engage in, in trading. Well, a lot, a lot of things, a lot of things go into it. Um, there's, you know, one component is thinking, you know, how much inventory um, should be supplied for a market of this nature. Another thing is, is thinking, you know, where, where do we kind of reasonably expect that the market will find value? Um, and, you know, we're not here to uh, dictate that by any means, but we're here to try to figure out what, where that value is. And, and we do that by starting with a very widespread and, and working in tighter um, until the market starts to find value. And, and hopefully that um, kind of uh, that, that point is uh, around where we uh, expected it to be. To date, are y'all primarily working with IDEX? So IDEX is, um, you know, one of my favorite exchanges um, to work with. Uh, they're also one of my favorite exchanges, period, um, because of the non-custodial nature of the exchange. Um, and the fact that you can have a um, hybrid decentralized exchange experience, uh, where but you have full transparency of the uh, of the reserves of all the orders that are in the market at any given time, et cetera. Um, but you don't have issues uh, with moving your orders around like you would with a full on-chain decentralized exchange, where um, as a market maker we need to um, you know move our bids and asks around quite frequently and with a full on-chain um, decentralized exchange that becomes economically infeasible to do. So you have to have so, gas, you have to use gas and, and put the, put, make it a transaction to make any adjustment. Exactly. Which just does not make sense. And that's kind of um, people not to get off on a tangent, but people talk about decentralized exchanges having no liquidity. It's because they're un unfriendly for market makers. Yeah. Whereas in this case, uh, the actual transaction. So if I go and I market sell a token, that transaction is going to look like a peer to peer transaction or does it look like a, uh, IDEX to IDEX transaction? I, but either way it's on chain, right? 
so are, are you talking about, are you talking about, um, so on IDEX, what happens? The part that's on chain versus off chain is just it's trying to clarify. If I set a limit order, it's going to not be on chain at all. It's just within IDEX's system. But once an order executes, that, that execution of the order will immediately uh, go towards the chain, right? Right. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be batch execution. So you have your tokens are sitting in a custodial um, contract and you're the signer for every transaction in that, and, and those signatures are required. You, you need to sign every transaction for it to, um, um, to actually take place with your own, with your private key. Yeah. I didn't intend to make this a decentralized exchange conversation, but <laughs> I started to think about it cause I couldn't remember. Cause I think some decks is like, the transaction itself, the DEX is basically an interface. So I'm, I'm literally sending tokens from my ledger to someone else's ledger or whatever. Yep, totally. And that's how it shows up. And I wasn't 100% sure whether IDEX shows it that way or if it shows, like you can kind of so, tell it's through the so, IDEX system. Yeah, they, they, don't, they don't do it that way. So IDEX has a, um, a custodial smart contract. So they're non-custodial in the sense that they're not holding your tokens and you have to sign all the transactions, but the tokens are being held in a smart contract that IDEX deployed. Whereas something like uh, a zero X relayer like Radar Relay or what have you um, is doing, uh, they're also doing non-custodial, but they're doing pure wallet to wallet transactions. So it's a little bit yeah. different. Yeah, I remember when I've traded on IDEX before, like you deposit to IDEX and I assume that's kind of engaging that smart contract. Correct, you're, depo you're depositing to, uh, to the IDEX uh, custodial smart contract. That's right. Okay. Are y'all working with other, um, other DEXs or do you, are you working with centralized exchanges? Do you have a preference? Um, so, so there's, um, there's definitely trade-offs to both. So we are working with, um, a plethora of other exchanges. Um, IDEX is really my favorite. Most tokens that come to market, most tokens that we work with are ERC 20. And I think IDEX is really like that kind of proving ground um, for uh, price discovery and, and for someone to discover um, a brand new nascent market. And, um, but we are working with other centralized exchanges. Um, a lot of those exchanges have um, high fees or they have very lengthy application processes, et cetera. Um, and it's better to work with them uh, once you've had some engagement on a smaller venue. Um, and then engage, you know, a bigger, a bigger exchange where there might be some significant compliance costs that um, you wouldn't necessarily think of um, that you have to fulfill, even if there isn't a listing fee. Um, mm -hmm. Just as an example, if you, if you wanted to, um, you know, list your token on, uh, on a Bittrex, you would have to list on Bittrex International first. And in order to fulfill the compliance requirements to list on Bittrex International, you would have to engage a VFA agent out of Malta because Bitrix International is a VFAA4 broker based in Malta. And you would need to engage a VFA agent to get a letter of opinion, et cetera, um, before you could even fulfill the compliance requirements. And that's gonna set you back um, you know, quite a bit of money. Um, so even though Bitrix doesn't charge listing fees. So there's, um, there's a lot to think about kind of behind the scenes when you're thinking of the strategy of, you know, what are going to be the best venues for a project um, to go to um, at different phases of their kind of adoption cycle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I know there's got to be so many challenges that you see firsthand that a team is like, what do I do? Or like, how do I, how do I go about this? Like, we don't want to be involved in the trading of our token because we're trying to stay out of that. But at the same time, like they know that they're supposed to, uh, it's a tradable token. It's a utility token. So there's there part of it is to be traded. Um, how do you engage or do, or do you engage directly with teams or are you do, engaging with exchanges that are wishing to list a token? How does that process work? So we engage with both. So we work with, we, because we work with a lot of projects, we have very favorable relationships with exchanges. Um, naturally, if a project is applying for, an exchange listing on their own. Um, they're not really coming from a, a position of strength because the exchange is going to want to know that you have a market maker in place. It would like, it would be like, you know, Facebook IPO um, on NASDAQ without having a market maker. Like it, it's, it's 
structurally impossible to happen that way because the regulations are designed around it. Um, but, and the exchange naturally has policies around it as well. Um, but in these markets, you don't really have that type of structure. Um, but naturally, the exchange is going to want a market maker to be bringing that project uh, to the exchange. Um, otherwise, the exchange is at risk of there being, um, you know, wide, widespread, no, no order book depth, et cetera, all the things that kind of cause um, friction for users when they come to, you know, purchase or, or sell that um, coin or token for, um, you know, whether it be for speculation, whether it be for the use case, like whatever it might be. Um, there's a big risk for the exchange if a market maker isn't in place um, because there's going to be a bad experience. They're not going to get any revenue and it's going to actually um, impair the reputation of the exchange itself um, because it's a poor experience for all the users and people remember that. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of the way that we work uh, with the exchanges. Um, the way that we work with the projects is really, you know, they, they, um, they want help navigating the space. Um, they, you know, understand or they've, they've come to understand from applying with the exchanges and not hearing back that, you know, they need to engage a market maker and, um, you know, hopefully they talk to us and they don't talk to some of the um, market manipulators that um, operate as market makers, but they're not actually market makers, they're um, crooks. Um, hopefully they talk to us and, and not them um, to help navigate these kind of um, uh, murky waters, right? Um, yeah, you did a great uh, chat. I was uh, mad at my friends over there at the Crypto Street Project uh, podcast because they got you before me, but you dug in a lot to the market manipulation stuff with them and uh, talked about some of the ways that people can do things in a very scammy uh, and often a legal way. So I don't want to dig in as much to that. I, I encourage people to go listen to it. And I want to talk about some of the market making principles in general and some of these challenges that you deal with uh, in, in the introductory process. Because if you were market making Bitcoin, like it's a very different game. Like you're not, you're not like onboarding a client <laughs> for the first trade <laughs> ever of Bitcoin. Uh, totally. So that would have been very, awesome. Yeah, and that'd be, I mean, we can talk about uh, market making and existing markets in a bit, but I want to dig into this market making of new markets because a lot, this is common where people, you know, they're, maybe they earn tokens in uh, some projects application or whatever, or they uh, buy tokens from a private sale or something. Some of that stuff's still going on. So I want to talk about this initial setup. Mm -hmm. Do you have to be bullish on the token as a market maker taking part in this? Because do you have to own tokens yourselves or is it like you're kind of controlling tokens owned by the project or the exchange? How does that part work? Because you have to offer, tokens have to be offered for sale from someone. Right. Uh, so how does that, right. that part of the setup work? So, so absent really good and efficient hedging strategies in the, uh, in the token that you own, um, assuming, assuming that's not available for, which for a lot of these, it's, it's just really not, um, you have to carry the inventory. So you have to have the inventory in the base pair, which, you know, on an IDEX, that's Ethereum, um, on, a, on a Bittrex or a Poloniex, um, that could be BTC, might be a USDT, whatever it, whatever it is. Um, you've got to have the inventory in the base asset. You've also got to have the inventory uh, in the token that you're looking to market make in. So and hedging uh, out your <laughs> Ethereum or Bitcoin exposure is easy. Uh, you can that, yeah. But how you, can you hedge out a, a token? I mean, I don't know how do you, how do you do that? How do you look at not, that? Not not really. Um, you know, you and it and it really depends on the strategy that you're operating as to how much inventory you really need. Um, but but. At the like, I would say overwhelmingly in general, uh, you're gonna have to you're gonna have inventory um, risk with that, um, and and if you're dealing in a, a very early illiquid asset, it's going to be very volatile. Mm -hmm. So having having conviction that you know this asset that you're holding on your balance sheet is worth something, 
and will continue to persist to be worth something um, in the future. And you know, by the way, by being a market maker, you can help um, you can help you know make that market more efficient and make it more valuable in that sense. Um, yeah, you should probably be bullish if you're holding an, if you're holding an inventory of it to market make. So if you're uh, if you're participating in market making, are you uh, typically getting access to those tokens? well before like you're planning to be a market maker for something that you know isn't even going to list for like six months or a year and you're taking part in the initial distributions or is it sometimes like you get an allocation somehow uh much closer to the process like maybe a team realizes oh we need a market maker we're gonna go talk to wes and <laughs> wes doesn't have any tokens of ours like how do how, what's the norm in that scenario yeah so i think there's kind of there's like two, there's two buckets of clients that we typically work with. Uh, the first bucket is typically uh, sometime after uh, the, the, you know, generation event um, of, you know, creating that asset and um, in between, you know, them getting on their first exchange. Um, that's typically where we get involved or, you know, potentially they got listed on an exchange that doesn't actually um, really exist and no one even knows about it. And, um, and then they'll contact us. And I still consider that asset to be like, you know, quote unquote, unborn. Um, the other area where, or the other um, time where we'll get involved is where uh, projects have tried to navigate this space on their own and have taken, you know, advice from exchanges that are operating in unregulated jurisdictions. And they've paid up, you know, um, to that exchange's own kind of internal market maker, I, I quote, because it's, it's, a, it's typically just um, fraud um, manipulation scheme, but they've either paid up to the exchange's own market making operation, um, or they've paid up for one of the exchange's buddies uh, who's running a um, you know, quasi arm's length market making operation on the exchange. And they've paid up significantly, and they haven't gotten any type of they haven't seen any real usage or adoption because that venue is just wash trading in the token. There's no actual, there's, there's actually no depth in that market. So even if someone does go to that exchange, they still can't uh, buy it or sell it. So they, they end up in the situation where they're hurting and now they don't really trust anyone, but they know they need to do something and they need to get on reliable exchange a reliable exchange with real users and ethical operators and and they and then they need to cure some of these market symptoms of having uh you know widespread no depth so that's another area where we typically come in and help teams so how do you uh how do you personally say and how long does it often take because you said you initially you know first trade you you have you're forced into a widespread as you learn where people are valuing the token. Um, but then you try to narrow down, uh, narrow down that spread, increase your depth so that you can um, offer more for sale if someone's come, willing to come in and buy it. And so that you can absor absorb more that are sold as someone's coming in to sell. Um, let's say a month in or two months in, how how do you, how do you want a market to look like what's a reasonable expectation for what a token market should look like because a lot of these i mean they're not trading millions of dollars a day they may trade fifty thousand dollars in volume every 24 hours or something so what's your idea of a good of a solid book and that maybe that's in relation to like overall market cap or something like percentage yeah. cap is that how you yeah. look at it yeah so um so, well, well, two things. I mean, ultimately we're looking at, I mean, these projects are re that we're working with are like literally across the board, right? And a lot of them have done, you know, some of them haven't sold any tokens whatsoever. And this is purely, you know, purely offer, right? Mm -hmm. Some of them the first, have The first list is like, that's the, you have no idea what people are going to pay for it yet. Right, right. Um, some have, you know, sold, um, sold tokens in a presale um, or a sapped offering, et cetera. Like the, the distribution uh, mechanics and, you know, the weighted average price and across all these deals and, and 
et cetera, can be like, it's absolutely across the spectrum. Like we've seen, we've seen everything. Um, and it's no one project is the same. They all have their own unique fingerprint. Um, but what we look for, at, you know, we're typically the monopoly dealer in these markets that we're operating in. And what we look at is a percentage of our participation relative to the total market. And we look to see if we're, if we're, if we're looking for healthy adoption of a project, we're looking for our percentage of participation uh, relative to the whole uh, as, as steadily trending down. So our importance become uh, us as a market maker becoming less and less relevant over time as that market um, gains adoption and gains more traction, more users, other market makers uh, picking up the inventory and, and spread trading in that market, et cetera. So that's one of the metrics that we look at when we're thinking of you know, is, is this market gaining adoption? Is it, is it growing and becoming healthy? Um, you know, we're very, very, very important at the start, but we want to become, um, almost, uh, almost like an insurance policy, right? Um, that, you know, you're working with us. There's all, we're always going to, there's always going to be depth in your market. There's always going to be a competitive spread, right? Um, but we become less and less important. The second thing that we look at when we're thinking about is a market healthy is how much depth. So projects never have problem supp problems supplying depth on the offer, in my experience, um, especially when you're talking about you know ERC twenty assets which are printed out of thin air by the dev team. Yeah, uh, there's never there's never a problem with uh, hundred percent of the supplies out there somewhere unless they're like locked up <laughs> or whatever. But for the most part. People will sell tokens for the right price. Correct. So there's there's never there's never a problem on the offer. The problem is um, is putting up liquidity in the base pair. So we typically look at liquidity in the base pair as a rough benchmark um, for an early stage uh, micro cap asset. We like to see, and this is a broad spectrum benchmark that's like not rigid, but you know at least one percent of the um, market cap within um, you know roughly 10 percent of the current fair value so that's one percent of the market cap right which you know if you're looking at an at a at a um a million dollar market cap that could be that could be as little as ten thousand dollars right so these a lot of these pro and if you look at um you know i think Masar you know masari is working on some um, some depth and spread metrics to add to on-chain FX, which I'm like super excited about. I've been a long-term long-term supporter of them. But if you look at CoinMarketBook.cc or .co, forget what it, I forget what it is exactly. Um, but I look at that a lot, and they do calculate um, the market cap to bid depth within 10% of the fair value, and they give it a ratio. And that's a really really useful tool just to see to look at a market and say okay is this thing completely fairy dust or not and by fairy dust i mean can the market cap just be evaporated with very little money you know what i mean any other direction right but it's typically it's down a, it's dot cc dot cc got it yeah i love that tool yeah that's cool i had not heard of that um so what do you do if you say the, the offer is usually there, meaning people are willing to sell. The bid varies. Um, when you're the, the market maker, are you responsible for pulling people together to be the bid? <laughs> or are you the lifeline, like you said, as the bid, uh, as the market maker? Where's the, where's the bid side, where are the bid side funds come from? Because that's just, that's not something you print. That's, you got to have <laughs> Ethereum for it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, typically, uh, you know, typically that's the team um, or, you know, a large purchaser, um, but, but almost always it's the team, um, you know, segregating a budget for, um, you know, putting up liquidity in the market. And um, naturally that, that's, um, you know, you know, the, the, the agreements, the arrangement, the information communication lines are all very segregated uh, between, um, you know, once that, once that budget has been provisioned, um, 
but um, typically it's the teams and the teams understand that no one can buy or sell their token unless there's um, you know a tight bid ask spread and um, relatively healthy liquidity levels in their market on all of the exchanges that, that they're trading on. Um, so it kind of falls, it falls down to the, um, it kind of falls to the project, which is an interesting thing uh, because you don't see this really in traditional markets, but it falls on the, on the projects themselves um, to provision um, those funds for liquidity. Mm. And I imagine this can get, for some projects, if it doesn't go as they hope, like it can become a source of stress for them, right? So like say they're the bid, but the 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 rest of the bid, like let's say they put in, I don't know, a thousand Ethereum towards that budget. And uh, the bid is never gets more than uh, 1,100. So it's like they don't, no one else comes in to support that market and say they're a willing buyer. And slowly the offer seeps in and the project just bleeds out. Now the team is just recollecting tokens probably at a higher price than they sold them initially because oftentimes these initially list higher than than the you know some private sale was or something. How do you talk to teams during this time of uncertainty and probably stress <laughs> for them? Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, we've seen we've seen um, you know, it's it's across the board. We see some projects that you know, they, they really take off and there's a lot of demand at the open and, um, you know, a lot of people want to get their hands on, you know, XYZ token, right? And, um, and sometimes that's like a pleasant, that's a pleasant surprise. Like there's so much initial um, action and that can be really exciting. Um, other times we see instances where like literally nothing happens, right? Or, um, or there's a lot of um, sell pressure from, someone who acquired tokens at a very low basis under what the um you know what the bid is at right and um you know that and the, and they just and they just start selling and you know um I, I mean i've seen instances where you know people um you know people get hacked and then you know the hacker has a zero basis wants to liquidate as quickly as possible and it kind of becomes an uh, a, it looks like an irrational market actor but it's really all about the about the basis right and a hacker has no cost basis, um, just like some, just like you know, some advisors who you know may have acquired a token and didn't really do any advising, have no skin in the game, right? And then they just bust up on the exchange, and they just start, and they just start selling, right? So um, you know, these things can be disappointing for teams, uh, but you know, it's not it's not our job to um, to kind of console them on this, um, and it's not our job to um, you know, dictate the price or or anything like that. Um, it's it's our job to help facilitate um, trading. And if the team has, you know, if if there's if the market doesn't value that token, if if the market doesn't value that token whatsoever, um, then you know that it is what it is. And you know we've seen that. So, um, but you know what's important for us is that you know we know that without having a market maker engaged there's never an opportunity and without being on a reliable exchange there's never an opportunity for this um you know new network or protocol or or whatever it might be you know loyalty token like who knows there's never an opportunity for it to serve its um, given use and we try to facilitate uh, the ability to transact in that market yeah, because the underlying basis for a utility token is someone needs to buy this to go and utilize a platform or what the network or whatever they've got going on. Um, Whether you're an enterprise fund manager or a retail trader, buying and selling cryptocurrencies successfully requires price discovery you can rely on. Brave New Coins Liquid Indices provide trusted US dollar prices for Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Ripple. Featuring end of day or intraday outputs, you can count on the BLX, ELX, and XRPLX for accurate US dollar pricing for smart contract oracles, settlement price discovery, net asset valuation, and performance analysis. Visit bravenewcoin.com to find out more. So let's go back to your, your risk in these scenarios because if you're inherently. Um, 
unhedged on the token itself. And I imagine some of that is maybe you have a fee structure to where you get some tokens as part of the market making structure, but I'm maybe some of it you do, you do own yourself. I don't know. Is that something you're able to disclose? Um, I, I'm not, I, there, there's a lot of things I'm not able to disclose. And um, if I were to give you, you know, concrete numbers or anything like that now, they might be different tomorrow. Um, so sure. I don't, I don't want to reference anything like that, but you know, we do have, um, you know, a lot of projects we do have on our balance sheet. Um, we do carry that, um, that, you know, kind of inventory risk. Um, but and whether the, yeah. And whether the cost basis is zero or the same price as everyone else, it doesn't really matter if it ends up on your balance sheet. That's just the way yeah. a corporation works. So totally. as the, as a token, uh, can depreciate, um, how do you, manage your own risk. You said you can't really hedge it, but have you figured out ways that you can hedge kind of the broader market going down? Like, are y'all able to operate in a way to where you say, well, roughly we have these statistics that say, you know, we're, we're, we're making uh, a dozen markets and yeah. they're kind of all hit with the same hammer, even though they're independent and we can yeah. hedge it in this way. How do you look at yeah, that? I, I think, um, you know, I think a lot of uh, businesses learned a very hard lesson last year on what happens when you speculate with a significant amount of your operating capital. And um, I think, you know, a lot of my friends are not around in the industry right now because of that. Um, it, it was a very tough year and a lot of tough lessons were learned. Um, you know, we, we, do, we do make um, decisions on when we want to hold a, lot, a larger exposure of crypto on our balance sheet. And we take fees in, um, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Euro, dollar um, tokens. Like it's, it's really across the spectrum as to how we um, kind of receive crypto assets and, and then make decisions of whether we want to hold them or move them um, to, um, you know, to Euro, dollar, et cetera. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you like right, you know, the past for, you know, really like 2019, uh, when, you know, crypto assets have been extremely depressed in valuations, uh, we've been taking on a lot more uh, crypto and, um, you know, like, you know, I'll call it, I'll, I bucket it into two, like cash and cash equivalent crypto, Bitcoin, Ethereum, right? And mm -hmm. then uh, token exposure. So everything else. Yeah. Uh, we've been taking on a lot more uh, crypto and token exposure uh, this year, whereas last year we were uh, very, very quick to um, if we did take in crypto, uh, we were very quick to move it to euro or dollar. Um, and, you know, those are just kind of business operating decisions. And I think we have, you know, quite, quite good insight into when we should be um, largely taking that exposure on or off. Um, but in terms of, in terms of taking on token exposure from projects that we work with, uh, you know, we look at that as, um, you know, we're, I'll be transparent on our fees in the sense that we're not taking token exposure on from a project that we're working with that we need to cover our operating costs. Okay. Okay. So it's not, it's not a business critical portion of your uh, balance sheet or, or income. No, exactly. It's like, it's, it's tail end. You know, if, if this project, um, you know, I think we play a very critical um, if not one of the most important roles in helping a project be successful. Um, because without having a market maker, without having that monopoly dealer at the beginning, um, it's incredibly hard to gain any type of adoption. And we're not the only way that you can, um, you know, provide liquidity. You know, there's things like bank core, which is kind of fading off and getting um, displaced by Uniswap. Um, there's things like um, Hummingbot that, that just recently launched that uh, helps, you know, kind of pull up community users to um, provide liquidity for market making and then the teams incentivize them to do so. Um, you know, there's, there's different ways to make sure this, um, that there's liquidity in that early stage asset. But if you don't have one of them, it's like virtually impossible um, to gain adoption. So um, I like to think we play a very um, helpful and meaningful role in the adoption process, um, help facilitating market adoption. And, um, you know, if, if an asset, you know, does gain significant adoption and we have it on our balance sheet, 
then, you know, six, 12 months later, that can be a very lucrative opportunity. Um, that was my next question is how do you divest yourself? Because theoretically, and I presume this is a natural effect of a successful project, uh, that trend of being a smaller and smaller percentage of the overall market mace, market making on that pair is going to go down. So your yeah. becomes a less lesser percentage of that market. And therefore your need for uh, a large inventory of that token goes down. So therefore you now have a token on your balance sheet that is opportunity and risk both. But mm -hmm. if you're well in profit or, you know, able to make money off that, you can divest yourself. When you divest, how do you sell? <laughs> you know, like, do you, do you <laughs> yeah. release that on an open market? Do you OTC? Do you, how do you do that? And in a way that like Matt meets your, your ethical standard for, you know, probably a contract with a team or an exchange or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's ethical. I mean, there's a lot of ethical considerations here that, and there's also uh, regulatory ones as well. So yeah. just as like a general rule of thumb, we're never going to cross um, a, a client account in any trade ever. And, um, you know, we are, uh, heavily regulated. We're operating as a um, under the Virtual Financial Asset Act in Malta as a VFAA class three broker, uh, whereas Binance, Bittrex, OKX, they're all class four brokers because they're exchanges. Um, but we are heavily regulated and we have to assume everything we do will be looked at. And I think the reason why we did that is because we operate to a higher standard than you see other market makers in this space um, so far. So inherently in that we structure all of our all of our arrangements with teams to be you know very ethical and and have and not have inherent conflicts of interest. When it comes to liquidating a token exposure um, for a client, you know that's that's something that um, you know has a lot of um, a lot of potential conflicts of interest that need to be navigated through very carefully. And um, general rule of thumb, we never cross client accounts uh, with our own. Um, and inherent in that is, you know, when we're, when a project has significant adoption and when we're able to, um, you know, liquid, when, you know, a, an asset is overvalued or there's significant liquidity event, you know, whatever it might be, if we want to reduce that exposure, um, it's, it's within the contract contractual guidelines that we've set out up front with the client. And it's again, um, never crossing any, any operate or any client accounts ever. Right. Um, so it's a long, it's a long, it's a long winded answer. Uh, the other component is that we have, um, a really, really robust algorithm set that helps us, um, you know, pick up exposure, um, you know, sell off exposure, et cetera. And, uh, that can be very useful for transacting in these markets. How did y'all develop uh, with minimal impact? How did y'all develop your uh, algorithmic strategies for making the market and doing, I'm sure, a lot of other stuff when you're trying to figure out how to, uh, how to do something? I imagine another one of the things you do, I'm just spitballing ideas here, but uh, as something gets listed in multiple places, you are making the market in multiple places. So you could be on Bittrex yeah. and, and on IDEX and, you know, you're trying to balance out so that it's a fair price on both and other things like that. So, uh, and I imagine the vast majority of that is algorithmic. Where did you develop your algorithmic strategies? Are you a developer? Is you have developers on your team? What's the? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So two things. So I'm I'm not a developer myself. Um, our our head um, our head quant uh, came from the traditional markets and had spent a lot of time um, uh, spread trading, uh, market making, etc. In traditional asset classes and. Um, and then I kind of served the um, served the role of coming from a uh, crypto hedge fund and, uh, and and being in the space since 2013 and kind of a variety of different capacities um, transacting like, you know, many people probably on the show on a bunch of different cryptic exchanges and uh, and gaining that experience. And uh, we put our we we, um, you know, kind of put our heads together to develop a solution for what I saw kind of systematically at the time. Um, you know, while I was at the fund, I saw a ton of projects uh, coming to the space, not having a market maker in place. And it was just kind of this sense of um, if I list it, they will come. 
and um, not an understanding that someone needs to put up that um, bid ask spread and, and put up those initial orders um, because if they come, really, really, really quick. <laughs> right. If, if they come and there's no orders there, they can't do anything. And I saw systematically that um, there was just this massive disconnect between uh, the teams that were launching projects and um, the exchanges that were listing them and the expectation of the, um, you know, the buyers and sellers. Um, there was just this missing component and that was having reliable market makers. So, you know, I, I looked at this space and I saw, you know, I mean, there's, there's tons of projects that are coming online every single day, right? Um, that don't have a solution and they don't have a market maker that is both regulated um, and ethical. So um, that's kind of the void that we sought to fill and we saw it as being uh, worthwhile, a worthwhile endeavor. Um, Why are you interested in these markets? Which I can, I mean, maybe there's some that are like mid caps, like they come online and they're mid caps and they engage you guys. But I imagine you work with a lot of like low caps, uh, a lot of stuff that's unproven, some certainly that fail. Like that's, that should, that's the expected outcome with like a typical token, even though, uh, you know, you're doing some good fundamental screening and stuff. Some are going to fail. Yeah, totally. Well, why are you wanting to make these markets that are uh, less known entities versus something that's been trading for a while? If it's already, if it's, it's still an altcoin or something, but it's already fairly liquid, but you see some opportunities to be one of many participants in that market, and you say, "Sure, I'll I'll make markets on the top 100 that are all pretty liquid," and you know, I think I have an edge there. Why approach this market of new projects, smaller caps, et cetera, rather than more liquid known markets? Yeah, so uh, you know, it's not mutually exclusive for us. We are trading um, in a lot of the higher volume markets, um, especially where there's um, you know, rich spreads like on IDEX, which are um, you know, we've seen quickly narrowing um, as, the, as the exchange gets more heavy um, algorithmic traders on it. Uh, which is unfortunate to us, but fortunate for the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, you know, but um, so we are. We are to answer your question. We are doing both. Uh, but you know, the the focus of our business and our core competency is really focusing on helping these early projects uh, come to market. And really, you know, that that's where they need us the most, and that's where we deserve to be paid um, the most uh, because we're all, we are so helpful, right? Um, and so critical to uh, their success. So you have a greater premium for taking the risk on a new project. Right. So the, the, the biggest opportunity is in new projects coming to the space. Um, and, you know, when a market gets a lot of adoption, uh, there's going to be a lot more competition, right? There's less risk, but there's more competition. Um, so the spreads are tighter, right? So what do you guys do when the market like just fully goes against you. You know, we've seen, uh, we've seen this happen where like uh, altcoins in particular, certainly relative. And I know you have to look at these relative to the dollar too. So it adds complexity to the way you view your balance sheet, but um, you know, relative to Ethereum, relative to Bitcoin uh, an altcoin can just bleed for like three months and it has nothing to do with the quality of the project, the quality of your ability to, uh, perform as a market maker, but nevertheless, like some of the stuff on your balance sheet is just melting <laughs> in term and in, in relative yeah. value. Uh, totally. So, do you? How do you? How do you finesse all of this? Because it freaks me out <laughs> just thinking about it. Right? Like the exposure yeah. you have. Yeah. I mean, I mean, some are some are doing bad, and hopefully others are. You know, and some are bleeding, bleeding, bleeding. And hopefully others are doing well. Right. But, you know, when the market, you know, the market is so very correlated um, and when the whole market, you know, pulls back, you know, when we're when we're um, when we're market making in a market, um, you know, a lot of the times, you know, we can make money if the market's going up. We can make money if the market's going down. But if the market's going down, our initial our, our inventory that we're hold, that exposure of inventory that we're holding is going down while we might be making. You know, if we're trading an asset on, we're spread trading an asset on IDEX 
uh, we might be making money every time a user crosses the market because we're able to stay at the front of the queue, uh, but that doesn't help that the underlying asset is going down. It might offset that, um, right. that loss a little bit. Um, Let's say, can but, we break that down real quick? Because not everybody sure. is with us, I'm sure. Sure. So you're on the spread, meaning you're algorithmically either the top or close to the top on the offer and the bid. You're kind of offering stuff for sale and for purchase on both sides. And when somebody crosses over and grabs it with a market order, uh, then you're the one that's there and you're making money on that bid ask spread. That's the, that's my like very not good explanation of, uh, of what a bid ask spread market making situation looks like. That's, that's a great, that's a great explanation. That's, that's exactly, that's exactly uh, what we're doing. The, the complexities around that are, um, you know, being able to stay neutral, meaning not picking up, not picking up, um, you know, an, a, um, an exposure um, greater than what you started with and holding that, um, you know, while the market moves, it, it becomes volatile in either direction. Um, so that, that's your picking up uh, some, I don't know what, how you analyze this, but maybe if you just, if the, overall price of that coin doesn't change. Maybe you can make, I don't know, one or 2% over some period of time, who knows. But now you're still doing that. That's still working. Yeah. But the coin, the coin, which you have inventory in now it loses 20% in two days. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> so totally. You may have made your one or 2%, but you lost 20% holding inventory. Yep. How do you deal with that? So we have, um, we have a lot of, um, it, it comes down a lot to a sophistication in your risk management principles that are built into your algorithms. So we have stochastic variables that, you know, if the market becomes very volatile, uh, we'll look to take, we'll look to widen the spread at which we're going to, um, at which we're going to put up in that market. Um, just in general, the more volatile the market is, the, um, the greater your risk is. And therefore, the greater return you should um, demand um, in order to take that risk. So, if there's volatile, so whether it's up or down, we're going to we're going to put up a wider spread. And again, that's all going to be done um, algorithmically. Um, I I can't I can't get into like the nitty gritty of how all of this works. Or um, I'll get a phone call um, from my quant, and he won't be happy at all. Um, but theoretically, but these, are, if you maintain, these, are, these are general. I mean, what I'm explaining now are just general principles. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if you generally manage, you ensure a half a percent spread while volatility is, you know, some, uh, some value. If volatility doubles, maybe you double your spread to 1% instead of half a percent. Exa exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, but nevertheless, at the end of the day, you're making more at least midterm decisions are these algorithmic as well as to when you may hedge out of all tokens. So um, I guess it depends on correlations too. Like, are you, are you constantly having to uh, look at here's the correlation of altcoins to Bitcoin uh, and Bitcoin to the dollar? Because sometimes alts go down because Bitcoin's going up, but alts are still kind yeah. of worth the same. Sometimes alts are going down and Bitcoin's going down and alts are like doubly wrecked. And that's where 2018 killed a lot of your friends that you're talking about. I'm imagining. Um, so like, are you adjusting your overall internal strategy for managing your, your, your book and hedging and uh, dealing with dealing with issues that come up based on those correlations? Is that algorithmic as well? Or are you guys doing that based on your own knowledge as, as market participants? So we're, we're doing what I think any business should do in the space is, is managing your, um, your, your crypto exposure very carefully, but we're not doing, we're not from a, from a business operating perspective of how much crypto exposure, um, generally are we going to hold, um, on our balance sheet? I would say we manage that very much like a hedge fund would. Um, and naturally we have, we have a mix, right? Um, Right now, we want to be uh, net long because we feel very bullish um, on longer time frames about the market and where we are in um, kind of the expansion cycle. Uh, we view it as still being, um, you know, from a from a macro expansion crypto market cycle perspective, it's still um, it's still very cheap and has a long way to go. Um, 
but we're man so we're managing that those kind of like decisions around that um, not in a high frequency way um, more in a you know let's make sure our exposure in, in any one asset doesn't get over you know our designated threshold and if it does let's talk about reweighting um, and you know let's talk about um, you know broadly you know where do we think we are um, you know by by weekly um, you know should we make any um, adjustments to our exposure and, and rebalance our portfolio um, things like that but we're not managing that um, algorithmically and you know for the most part it's uh, making decisions around, you know, do we want to hold more cash right now or more crypto? And uh, and right now the answer is uh, absolutely more crypto and has been for um, the majority of this year. Um, and I think we'll continue until uh, we reach um, kind of where we view as um, peak um, valuation zones. Do you feel more like you're a, or do you still feel like you're kind of a hedge fund since you're, um, you're basically taking long exposure, at least in the firms that you're working with. Yeah. I mean, it's still feel, I mean, from, um, from managing, uh, from managing the, uh, crypto exposure that we have on our balance sheet. Um, absolutely. It feels very similar. Um, I think having the experience, um, puts us at an advantage as a company, whereas other companies kind of take on that, um, balance sheet risk and they um, and they they don't understand how hyper volatile the underlying assets are and they don't have you know a um, they don't have a third party engaged that knows what they're doing that can hedge hedge out that risk if they need to hold it on their balance sheet etc um, so I think we're definitely at an advantage um, from a company um, you know operating perspective of um, you know, just having been in the space and, and having me um, have, you know, been, you know, my time at the hedge fund, et cetera. Are you, um, what's your, what's your big picture look on the concept of utility tokens, app tokens? I mean, you have to have some confidence that they can appreciate whether or not you're personally uh, bullish on them as a concept. Like, are we going to tokenize the world in your mind or, uh, do you think there's a lot of risks and unknowns? Is it still an experiment on you or is it an inevitability? How do you look at the token market? Because I personally come from a perspective where for the most part, I think I'm a token skeptic and a Bitcoin bull, if that makes sense, with like yeah. a handful of exceptions. Um, yeah. The idea of thousands of tokens, I have really struggle with. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think, I mean, I mean, to be, to be completely honest, um, I mean, I'm personally, I'm more of a proof of work maximalist. I believe okay. that proof of, proof of work is really the, um, the most ingenu ingenious and best um, distribution strategy um, that's ever been thought of in the entire world. I don't think anything comes even remotely close to, as being, to being as effective and fair as proof of work, period. So I'm naturally... Um, and, and being able to value a proof of work mineable cryptocurrency is very concrete. Being able to understand um, how much skin every individual participant has in that game is very concrete um, and easy to do. So naturally, I'm most bullish on um, proof of work mineable cryptocurrencies. But I do think that there are unique ways that people are um, leveraging tokens to organize people around or you know create you know decentralized autonomous organizations and um you know have on-chain cap tables and um have trustless ways of interacting with each other and i think there's a, a lot of interesting use cases there um especially around coordination but um i don't pretend to be bullish on the majority of the coins i think the majority um are complete trash um and don't have any hope of success um, but, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not wise enough to be able to look into the future and say which ones are going to emerge. And um, really, as a market maker, it's not my job to um, I mean, I've, I've, been, I've been surprised. Um, my product, got, you know, I looked at it and I thought, you know, this will never work. This, will, this isn't interesting at all. And, um, and people value it in the market, right? Whereas, whereas I didn't. Um, but 
you know, the, the good thing about being a market maker is it's not my job to, um, to kind of determine whether something has value. And my opinion um, doesn't really matter. Um, you know, my job is to help facilitate uh, people to be able to transact in that in, in whatever asset it is and to pay a fair price for it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, that's, I think that's a really comfortable position to be in. Whereas, um, a lot of, you know, kind of, um, you know, diversified hedge funds that are allocating into the space, um, need to make, you know, a long or short thesis on particular assets. And I think that's a, um, a much harder, um, job to do. Yeah. So have y'all participated in, um, market making on brand new coins that are fully proof of work. Like I think of like a grin or something like that. Um, or is that a lot harder to do because oftentimes they don't have any funding. <laughs> it's not like they enter a contract necessarily. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But do you just kind of show up and participate yourself or how do, is it just one of the casualties of the business that you can't, it's harder for you to participate in something if it starts proof of work, you know, no, uh, nothing else out there. It's, it's a lot harder. It's a lot harder, um, with proof of work. Um, we are working with a, um, a, a grin fork, um, that I can't disclose, uh, which one it is. Um, and, and it's been very, it's been very interesting, uh, trying to structure exactly how that, um, how that's going to look. Um, but most of the projects that we've worked with have started off as ERC 20 and have done some type of, um, fundraise, whether it's been, you know, the founder themselves, um, you know, um, supporting and, and seeding that company, um, or whether it's, you know, done an ICO, et cetera, IEO, et cetera. Um, most are ERC 20. And, you know, the reason being, um, is that ERC 20 has a very, um, incredibly powerful, uh, liquidity mode. So every exchange can support ERC-20. Every exchange does support ERC-20 token standard. Uh, to list a new asset, it's changing the contract address, right? Uh, when, you have, when you have coins, and you see a lot of coins die when they do this, when they you know, move over to their main net, um, it can become fatal because at, at one end of the spectrum, you need... Um, broad distribution, broad geographical ge distribution across different jurisdictions, um, like broad exchange coverage um, for your project um, to be, you know, bought and sold for its given use case or purpose or whatever, right? And they can't be uh, there to support your crappy blockchain that's custom. But yeah, you, um, so now you move over to mainnet and um, no one, uh, no exchange is supporting your, you know, special little blockchain and therefore you get delisted from everywhere or you need to pay uh, for pay for the exchange to do um, to build out a, a, a special wallet for your project, which can be very expensive. Right. Yeah. Um, so those are those are some of the things that we have to help, you know, teams navigate through and, and think through. And. Um, yeah, I mean, it, there, there's always an interesting challenge there. Yeah. Uh, I've not, I've not thought about that a whole lot. And I guess, so if it's raw proof of work, fairly launched, whatever you want to call it, all that stuff, let's use Grin as our example. Cause I can't really, I'm not good at thinking of which ones are doing this type of stuff. Um, if you did want to get involved, is that what happens a lot of times with those initial spikes? Do you think sometimes that's market makers getting some baseline inventory so that they can then go in and start making the market or, uh, what, what are the economics, I guess, if a market maker said, if someone says, I want to be involved in this brand new coin, I, I'm going to go in there and, and yeah. like, can you make it, can you only be there from one side at first and so into the market? So those, those big spikes that you see, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of different kind of things that are going on and participants in the background of things that are happening on one side, you've got. Um, miners who have been mining early on and have accumulated a, a large position, right? Very, very during the highest, um, highest inflationary period early on, 
right? And, and every chain yeah. can be different. Well, I guess um, even for a brand new proof of work, it's not going to get on an exchange until it's been mined for a bit. So if you really wanted to make that market, you could come in and OTC somehow from somebody. Uh, you, you can OTC a lot of the, uh, I mean, a lot of, um, you know, there's, there's hedge funds that have created uh, mining SPVs that might want to, um, you know, engage a market maker or a market make themselves or license um, market making um, algorithm, um, et cetera, to, uh, to put up a, a healthy bid ask spread in that asset. There's, there's all types of different participants that acquire coins in different ways that might want to help, um, you know, seed a healthy market um, early on by market making. I apologize. Right. I didn't mean to cut you off on the, the wild coin pumps on list. Oh, <laughs> I to figure out your theory, your thesis on that. So, yeah, so there's, um, the, the, the interesting thing you've got, just like you mentioned, there's, there might be, there might be very, a very low float. There might be a very small supply that's available on that listing. And there might be, um, you know, market makers, um, you know, discretionary traders, whoever, that might want to pick up that inventory and it might be offered very, or it might be retail traders that are just pushing the market buy button and have no idea how deep that market is on the offer um, who, uh, who pay, you know, effectively 90%, uh, percent, um, you know, on that transaction that they, they don't even realize they're doing that until they see a huge spike in a very illiquid, thinly traded market. Um, those are those are some reasons why a market might um, spike so high initially. Yeah, um, and I don't necessarily mean like something's worth you know half a Bitcoin per token in the first right. few minutes, but a lot of times you know there's this I don't know a week or a month or something where it's like it just looks like it's going gangbusters for a bit before it steadies out, and I don't know if it's hype yeah. or if it's if some of it is people seeking inventory so that they can then do participate in the market. I imagine though, most smart market makers are going to find their inventory in other ways than participating in a big old uh, <laughs> exchange listing pump. That sounds much more retail to me. Well, well, the um, who you do see participate um, typically on these, typically on these offshore um, small cap, completely unregulated, unethical exchanges where a lot of the projects will trade uh, very early on is you'll see a listing price um, that's very, very high. And then you'll see a slow bleed um, thereafter. Right. And, and that's typically um, the exchange who has required the project pay a significant inventory of their token um, to get listed. And then the exchange is market maker will just put the token, they'll open the price at a very high valuation, and then they'll just sit on the offer um, until they run out of inventory. So naturally they wanna open that market as high as possible and start selling out their inventory as high as they possibly can. So that gets to your mention earlier of the scammy and probably illegal uh, market making activities and collusion between a market maker and an exchange or whatever, or where the exchange is the market maker. Exactly. So um, you'll know if you, if you, having said that, if you look back at a lot of projects um, when they first traded and you see that, that massive open, like just absurdly high and the slow trickle down, you'll see that trend um, very, um, very prevalent across a lot of the, um, the small cap offshore exchanges. And it'll be kind of like an aha moment, like, oh, that I see what happened now, right? Yeah. Interesting. All right. Uh, let me ask you one more question because I don't want to end on something sad like that. But what are you, <laughs> uh, what are you most excited about? I guess in this, in the, in the market in general for the next year. Um, the market in general. I mean, as as a market maker, I'm excited for. Um, the market to begin to begin kind of picking up speed and more legitimacy and um, and having this massive um, expansion cycle um, that we're starting to feel kind of the beginning of right now. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about that because I'm incredibly uh, bullish on uh, Bitcoin um, and, I, and I have been since I entered the space um, as a novice in 2013. Um, I've, I've always been incredibly bullish and um, I've only gained conviction every year. Um, that that this is like absolutely 100% uh, 
um, world changing technology that we're experiencing and, and getting to witness the evolution of. Um, so I'm incredibly excited for that. And, you know, the market, the expansion cycles always bring um, a new wave of innovation. So every time the projects get, get better um, and every time, um, you know, there's new innovative ideas. So I'm really excited to see, um, you know, new innovative projects come to market and new, um, you know, and new technology emerge that, that we haven't seen. Um, you know, things like, things like Zero X um, and other projects that were kind of, um, you know, just like really exciting when they came out. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to see that again. And we're starting to see some projects like um, Casper, um, projects like Algorand, um, you know, Filecoin coming soon. Finally. Um, you know, <laughs> finally. Um, but the, um, the bar is being raised and there's more people in the space. And um, I'm just really excited for, you know, what's to come. Do you think the bear market took enough trash to the curb to uh, prevent some of the junk? Or is that just always going to be a part of it? <laughs> I, 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 think, um, I think there's, a, there's I mean, if we look at the, um, if you look at CMC, the list is very long. Um, you know, there's, and there's, there's still a lot of fairy dust existing, um, that, that hasn't quite gone away yet. And, you know, naturally with every expansion wave comes a, a stage of euphoria and you see a lot of the value, um, kind of flow down the caps or, you know, whether it's into new, exciting, innovative projects or whether it's into, you know, complete utter trash projects. It, it, it flows when down. When the old dead ones start pumping, that's when you need, yeah. <laughs> to, you need to be careful. <laughs> that's when you need to be careful. Um, you know, I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see a lot of, um, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of new entrants enter the space and, um, and kind of appropriate some of the value that's generated here. Um, just like we did last cycle, just like we did the cycle before that. Um, but ultimately I look at it as a net positive and, um, and I, and I think the standard every cycle becomes, um, greater and greater. Wes, thanks for joining me. People can go to liquidmalta.com to, uh, learn more about your business and, and services that y'all offer. You're on Twitter. I apologize. I don't have it right in front of me. What's your handle on Twitter? <laughs> it's Wes underscore Dwayne, D-E-W-A-Y-N-E. Excellent. And I'll link that up in the show notes. I appreciate you joining me. I could uh, sit here and speculate about the future of uh, <laughs> markets for another hour for sure. Uh, but people need to give you a follow. I've uh, enjoyed getting to know you over this year. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you next time. Likewise. Thanks so much for having me, Brian. Talk soon. Bye. Monuments crumble. Just run dry In a house of cards I feel the breeze Wound so tight